If you want to hear about how Richie's teenage years are documented in another Stephen King novel, then stick around to the end of this video. You went online, clicked on this video, basically dragged me out here to the studio, and now I'm gonna have to analyze this f***ing character. So welcome to Horror History, my name is Zach Morris, you may remember me from Saved by the Death Bell, and in today's lesson I'll be breaking down the story of Richie Tozier. Everyone else seemed more interested in breaking down the glasses of Richie Tozier. He's constantly bullied for his spectacles and his loud mouth, but despite his poor eyesight, I think it's Richie's eyes that are the key to understanding him. With that in mind, let's take it back to Richie's early days as a young rock and roller. Richie Tozier was born in the year 1945. As far as we know, Richie was the only son of a dentist named Wentworth and his wife Maggie. Maggie had hoped to have a girl and isn't always a fan of Richie's boisterous personality. Richie always had poor eyesight and seems to suffer from ametophobia, or a fear related to one's eyes. One time when he was very young, he dreamt that he had poked his eye full of blood, and when he woke up, he was actually relieved that he'd only wet the bed. Richie had a good relationship with his father. Wentworth never went easy on Richie, but he understood his son and would sometimes even do voices with him. Wentworth took Richie out to see the Paul Bunyan statue when it was first unveiled in Derry's city center. As a kid, Richie would most often hang out with his friend Stan Uris, and the two would sometimes go to the Barrens and do stuff with Bill Denbro and Eddie Kasprak. There aren't really any Richie and Stan scenes in the book, but we're given the impression that they're close in both movies. They show up as a pair in the 1990 version, and Richie is the only one to attend Stan's bar mitzvah in the 2017 adaptation. Richie was best known for his voice impressions, which included Kinky Briefcase, Sexual Accountant, Jim from Huckleberry Finn, The German Commandant, Toodles, The English Butler, Now! Pip Pip and Tellio, my good fellows! The Movie Newsreel Narrator, Newsflash Ben, school's out for summer! Granny Grunt, Poncho Vanilla Voice, Doesn't smell like caca to me, senor! Chinese Coolie, and many, many more celebrity voice impressions that probably would've had the SJWs up in a f***ing rage if the internet had been around back then, but it wasn't, so instead, Richie's impressions, which most agreed were rather pedestrian, Your voices all sound the same, Richie. seemed to piss off the bullies of Derry more than anyone. They were constantly chasing him, beating him up, breaking his glasses, and disliking his videos without even watching them. Okay, I made that last one up. But one day at school, the leader of the bullies, Henry Bowers, slipped on a puddle and... Yeah, let me just play the clip. Hey, way to go, Banana Heels! How was this kid considered a loser? If he grew up when I did, he would have been considered a f***ing legend. So after school that day, the bullies were looking for him, and they chased him all the way through town to Freese's department store, where he hid in the toy department, then snuck out of the emergency exits. The scene is not in any movie so far, but Richie's Freese's t-shirt in the 2017 film suggests that maybe he hid there in the book because he knew the ins and outs of the place. Now Stan might be Jewish, but Richie is probably the most relatable character for me because of his love for horror movies, rock and roll, and his overwhelmingly charming personality. Okay, fine, take that out. It is a gift! But Richie sees a poster for a rock show that he wants to go to, but knows that his mom wouldn't let him. So he sits on a bench in the sun, and the Paul Bunyan statue moves and stares him straight in the face, threatening to eat him. The ground would shake with Paul's enormous steps, and Paul destroyed the bench that Richie had been sitting on moments before with his giant axe. When he looked back, the scene was normal. This was obviously his first encounter with It, but Richie is somehow able to convince himself that it was just a dream. He probably does have bad dreams with all the scary movies he's watching from such a young age, and his obsession with the media can be both a strength and a point of weakness for him. This is why I think Richie's eyes and glasses are so significant, because it's generally the things he sees in movies or on TV that scare him. But it's also the things he sees on those same programs that help him fight back against it, whether it be his voice impressions or by using tactics that only work in the movies. In this case though, nothing really comes of it, and the experience sticks in the back of his mind. On the first day of summer, Richie has to stay back and help his dad clean out their attic, but the next day, Richie and Stan show up to help Bill, Eddie, and Ben build a dam in the stream in the Barrens. Richie enjoys hanging out with them there because his antics get him in real world trouble, but not in the Barrens. That afternoon, each of them reveals their personal encounters with Pennywise, but Richie, still under the belief that his was a dream, has nothing to share. They're interrupted by Mr. Nell, the Irish dairy police officer who's angry at them for backing up the drainage system with their dam. Richie demonstrates his inability to control his ever-running mouth. How's things back in the old country, Mr. Nell? It bulged. Ah, you're a sight for sore eyes. Sure, and Bagora, you're a lovely man. Credit to the old sud. 
Only Bill telling Richie to shut up makes him stop. Mr. Nell ends up making them clear it up and agrees not to rat them out if they do. That evening, Bill and Richie are walking home together and Richie asks to see the picture of Georgie that winked at Bill. After talking about it with Richie, Bill starts to feel like he's in a better place. This is the first of many examples of Richie offering support to Bill. After being the seer of the group, this is the next most important aspect of Richie's character, in that he's always there for his friends, especially Bill. We continue to see more of that throughout the story. It isn't until they actually arrive in Georgie's room that Richie starts to freak himself out a little bit. He can see the dried blood on the pages of the album and feel the cold touch of its pages. Georgie's school picture is missing, but there's a photo from the olden days of Derry with two sailors. They were Richie and Bill. The photo comes to life like a movie, and they see Pennywise pop over the edge of the canal like a jack-in-the-box only it has Georgie's face. Richie saves Bill by pulling him out of the photo after he tries to reach his hand inside, and they flee from Georgie's room. This is the first time that Richie realizes that what they all saw were not just stories or movies. The thing that had been haunting Derry was a monster. Richie Tozier would have been subscribed to this channel with death bell notifications on because Richie was a fan of horror movies. And one Saturday, not too long after the day they took down the dam, I Was a Teenage Werewolf was playing at the Aladdin Theater in town. He bargains with his dad to earn $2.50 for mowing the lawn, though Richie claims that this is blackmail because his father knows he wants to go to the show. Keep in mind, this was 1958. It didn't cost $17.50 to get into a movie or $15 a month for movie fast to f you in the Ben Hanscom also has no money, having spent it on junk food, so Richie spots him. Then they run into Beverly Marsh. Richie admired Bev's looks, but mostly liked her sense of humor. Bev doesn't have any money, and Richie pays for her tickets as well, since the tickets were only 25 cents, which they jokingly refer to as a date. They sat on the balcony to avoid Henry Bowers and his gang, but they were spotted on the way out and surrounded in the alley next to the movie theater as they tried to sneak away. Ben led the escape effort by throwing a garbage can to knock over Henry Bowers, and Richie ended up using the lid as a shield, blocking a punch from Belch Huggins and helping them get free and escape. The next time Bill and Richie get together, they decide to go to the house on Kneebolt Street to investigate Eddie's story about the encounter with It. Richie rides on the back of Bill's bike. They crawl in through a broken window and discover a coal pit in the basement. The cellar door flies open and a werewolf wearing loafers, faded jeans, and a Derry High School jacket enters the room. Remember, it's the things that Richie sees in the media that scare him. So It takes the form of the teenage werewolf from the movie he had seen. I also think that because Richie is basically the eyes of the group, whenever they're together, it usually takes the form of Richie's fear. Bill brought along his father's gun, but that doesn't hurt the werewolf nearly as much as Richie, who uses his Irish cop voice to scream at it with a sense of authority. He also throws sneezing powder at the creature, sending it into a fit. Something that would probably only work in the movies, but it works because Richie believes in it. It's likely that It detected Richie is the seer of the group and tried to go for his eyes. The two escape on Bill's bike and they look back to see the clown, Pennywise, now coming after them in a Derry High School jacket. As the calendar rolled over into July, Richie often found himself in the company of Bill, Eddie, Ben, Beverly, and Stan. Henry and his gang would refer to them as the Losers Club. On July 3rd, they got together to shoot off fireworks when a boy named Mike Hanlon approached them. Mike was being chased by Henry Bowers. The Losers Club helped defend Mike by fighting back against the Bowers gang by throwing rocks. Richie joins in in pelting Moose Sadler, the tank of the opposition, and the now seven losers are able to drive Henry and his thugs away. That's when they welcome Mike into the group, and with the seven of them, the wheel is complete. They decided to build a clubhouse in the Barrens for protection against Bowers. Richie brought along his battery-powered radio so that they could listen to rock and roll while they worked. Rock and roll is one of the few things that the Losers Club and the Bowers gang seem to agree on, whereas the older generation, the parents of Derry, are against it. Richie is kind of the authority when it comes to rock music among the seven of them. There seems to be a bit of a parallel between the music and the ability to see the manifestations of it. For example, Bill's parents are unable to see the blood in Georgie's room, and Beverly's parents can't see the blood in her bathroom. In general, the adults in town all turn a blind eye to violence, but the kids, the rock and rollers, can see it. The Losers Club in particular grow up and hold on to their love of rock and roll, and they become some of the few adults who are able to see it. One day, Mike brings his father's dairy photo album, and Pennywise animates in one of the pictures and threatens to kill the losers. The first form it changes into is Richie's werewolf, because it always seems to start with the form that scares Richie. The eyes of the group. Later that month, Ben Hanscom has an idea about how they should proceed in fighting back against it. He tells what he knows about the Indian smoke ceremony. Basically, Indian tribes would come together when they had to make a big decision, and they'd sit around the fire in a smoke hole until one of them had a vision telling them what to do. The losers decide to try it inside their new clubhouse, but the smoke is too much for Stan, Ben, and Eddie. Richie sees their 5 by 5 foot clubhouse expand. Beverly and eventually Bill end up bailing out as well, leaving just Richie and Mike. 
The room seems to have expanded to the size of a ballroom, and it was getting so smoky that they could barely see each other. Then Richie felt himself float up. They weren't inside anymore. They were standing in the middle of the barrens. Richie, the seer, and Mike, the historian, were seeing the arrival of it, thousands or even millions of years ago, like a movie. Only they were a part of it. A burning object falls through the clouds, and Richie's first thought was that it's a spaceship. He's able to determine this without even knowing that it is a cosmic creature. Animals flee the area of the impact, and Richie and Mike are pulled out of the smoke hole by the others. It took Richie a while to come to, and the others admitted that they didn't think he was going to survive. He threw up twice, but he had to survive to tell the story. I mean, I guess Mike could have also told them, but it sounds a lot more believable with the same story coming from two people. For the first time in his life, it was Richie who could see things and the others that could not. Can only virgins see this stuff? Is that why I'm not seeing this shit? And this moment would be ingrained in his mind for years and years to come. Almost three decades, in fact, until he needed it most. Here's a riddle for you. What's the best way to come out of an ad break? With an arm break. Eddie gets his broken by Henry. I apologize. That was... I'll, I'll try not to do that again. Richie is there when the losers sneak back to the hospital to sign Eddie's cast while his mother isn't there. Eddie's mother is definitely not a fan of Richie's foul mouth and habit of smoking cigarettes. While they were waiting for Mrs. Casprack to f*** off, they did a little target practice with a slingshot at the Barons, trying to determine who should be the one to shoot Pennywise. Richie only nicked one out of the ten cans, but he held on to one of the cans that Beverly had punctured as a proof of concept. Over the course of the rest of that July, Richie was there to support his friends every step of the way. First when Bill broke down in the rain and screams out about how he's going to kill Pennywise, then it's Richie and Bill who get the idea to make silver bullets to fire at it, and then finally on July 25th, they arrived at the 29 Niebold house to try to take the clown down. In the movie, Richie freaks out when he finds a missing poster of himself, but in the book he's just grossed out when he opens a cupboard to find a litter of rats. They get to the last door, which seems to have been a bathroom, with white shards lying everywhere from the destroyed toilet, as if Badlands Chugs had just taken a massive shit there. As as always, when Richie's around, the form that it takes is the teenage werewolf with the high school letterman jacket. Richie is the first to realize what form it's taking and screams out to warn the others. And although the losers take a couple of tough shots, they're able to drive it back down into the sewers. The two weeks that follow are pretty uneventful and consist of a lot of games of Parcheesi. The day of the big confrontation with it starts with Richie and Eddie getting popsicles in town, when Bev and Ben come to warn everyone that Henry Bowers had lost it and was trying to kill her under the orders of it. Bill decides that now is the time to retaliate, and they climb into the sewers at the pumping station in the Barrens. Richie is the last one to go in and sees Henry run up and slip on a puddle, so he yells, Hey, banana heels, before climbing down. When Henry tries to go in after them, Richie bit him in the ankle before running up with his friends in the drain pipe, thus fully earning his nickname of Trash Mouth Tozier. Oh, okay, trash the trash mouth, I get it. Eddie navigated as they searched for its lair in the sewer, sometimes having to scoot or crawl to fit through the pipes. At some point, it gradually started to get lighter, and Richie Richie noticed what would be the first form of it the losers would face down in the sewers, a giant eye with six tentacles resembling the crawling eye, a horror movie that Richie was afraid of. This form combined his sensitivity to his eyes, a metaphobia that I mentioned earlier, and the tendency for it to use the forms of horror movies that Richie had seen in order to scare the entire group. They are only able to escape when Eddie, the only one who wasn't restrained, attacks the eye by believing his aspirator was filled with battery acid and spraying it. After moving on from the crawling eye and entering the lair, Richie saw the rotted bodies of some kids who had been abducted by it during that summer. And the one that really hit home was Edward Corcoran, a boy who was the same age as Richie. The true form of it is the deadlight, but the Losers Club's human minds aren't able to process something like that, so they see it as a giant spider. Bill is successful in his mind battle against it in the Macroverse, a fight where Richie plays a major turning point in the movie. In the book version, it's mostly just Bill versus It in the other dimension, but as Richie started to sense that they were coming back from the macroverse, a ripple went through his body, sending his glasses crashing to the floor and shattering. The losers escape from the sewers, and each one of them partakes in the promise, a blood oath that if It should ever come back, they would come back to try to kill It again. During this promise, Bill notices that Richie's face looks different without his glasses. This is symbolic of the fact that after defeating It, each loser stops being a loser and starts transitioning into the successful adults that they would become. With It thrown back into a deep sleep, 
Richie would no longer need to be the group's seer, and after overcoming such a huge obstacle by defeating it, Richie would no longer be bothered by trivial things, such as being bullied for his glasses or his emetophobia. Also, most of the bullies were dead at this point, so that probably helps. Richie stayed close to his six friends, but that would be the last time the whole group got together in the same place at the same time. In the Stephen King novel 112263, Richie makes a small and questionably canon appearance. An English teacher named Jake Epping travels back in time to prevent the assassination of an American president, and he ends up stopping in Derry during the fall of 1958, approximately two months after the Losers Club defeats it. Whenever you're dealing with time travel, you run the risk of creating multiple timelines. Believe me, I'm a Legend of Zelda fan, I know. So there may now be a timeline where Jake Epping interferes and one where he doesn't. However, the Derry that Jake visits seems to be at least very similar to the one in the novel It. For example, there's a mention of Patrick Hockstetter's body being discovered in the Barrens, which lines up with the events of It. Jake discovers Beverly and Richie dancing near the fence on the border of the barons, and is taken back by their joyfulness. Perhaps they're more relaxed than the rest of the town now because they are two of the seven people that realize that the threat has now passed and no more murders are going to take place. Bev and Richie are able to connect with Jake because, as an outsider, he seems to realize the disconnected nature of most of the adults in town. Going back to my rock and roll analogy from earlier, it would be reasonable to say that Jake is on the same page as them because he's probably grown up on rock and roll himself, having been born in the late 70s. Also during this meeting, Beverly expresses her belief that It is merely sleeping, so it's possible that the losers quickly came to this conclusion after the events of 1958. They were not wrong. Richie and the Losers Club would eventually have to come back and fulfill their promise when It rose again in the 80s, but before that happened, Richie had some growing up to do. In the spring of 1960, Richie's family relocated to the Midwest, and the memories started to fade throughout his teenage years. In the year 1965, around the age of 18, Richie switches from eyeglasses to contact lenses, thus officially completing the transition into adulthood that began with the fall of It. But his glasses would stay with him in a way throughout his adulthood. Shortly after, he started college and became a DJ at his school radio station, and he was pretty good at it. Richie already saw his own potential to be great. He was a hit on his campus, and eventually he moved moved to Hollywood to pursue his dream further. That same year that he moved to California, he fell in love with a woman named Sandy. She hot? Neither of them wanted Sandy to get pregnant, so Richie got a vasectomy. Richie continued to date Sandy for another two and a half years until a job offer sent her to Washington, and Richie was brought on as a DJ for a Los Angeles FM radio station called KLAD. One year after their breakup, Richie woke up with the sudden urge to get his vasectomy reversed and went to a doctor to find out if he could, only to discover that he had undergone an extremely rare spontaneous regeneration. In other words, Richie's sperm had been healthy for some time, including the time that he was with Sandy. Each member of the Losers Club has unexplained infertility, although Richie may actually be the exception to this because he's a smoker and he didn't quit until 1981. Four years after that, in 1985, Richie is at work when he receives a call from Mike Hanlon, letting him know that it had come back. He calls his travel agent to arrange a flight, and she asks him to do his kinky briefcase sexual accountant voice as she makes arrangements for him to stay at the Derry Townhouse Hotel. His manager, Steve, chews him out for skipping out when he's actually scheduled for a broadcast tomorrow, where he's supposed to interview Clarence Clemens. Without realizing it, Richie packs a bunch of kids' clothes into his suitcase, a sign of the rock and roll loving comedian kid still being alive inside of him. Yeah, and I think the rabbi's gonna pull down your pants. Turn to the crowd and say, where's the meat? <laughs> After Mike's call, Richie's childhood memories start to trickle back. And in the plane ride on the way to Derry, Richie feels the same burning sensation in his eyes that he felt during the smoke hole ceremony when he was 11 years old. As the group reconvenes, they begin to reassume their old roles, and Richie feels the eyes that discovered its origin and basically dictated the forms of it returning to their old roles as well. After his plane lands, he drives the rest of the way in a rental car, but he pulls over when he sees the sign for Penobscot County, Derry, Maine. I'm guessing that's not the same sign that I pointed out in my Things You Missed episode on the 2019 Pet Cemetery, because that one didn't mention Penobscot County. County. But don't worry all you Pet cemetery fans out there, because when Richie pulls over, an Orinco chemical fertilizer truck roars past him on the highway. This is the same type of truck that runs back and forth on the road where the Creed family lives in Pet cemetery. But this isn't an episode of Things You Missed, this is horror history. So let's continue on with the history of Richie Tozier. Richie joins Mike, Bill, Eddie, Ben, and Beverly for a reunion lunch at Jade of the Orient, where Mike fills them in on everything that's gone down in Derry since its reawakening. After the meal, they receive their fortune cookies, and each one contains a horrific surprise from Pennywise pertaining to the person who opened it. Richie's contains an eye. See? All that stuff I've been saying this entire video wasn't bullshit. 
Everyone decides to go to a place they remember best from Derry. Richie gets into a cab, and the driver is the same man who had taken Bill around earlier, a particularly foul-mouthed guy who constantly adds the disclaimer, pardon my French if you're a religious man, I wish I got to see this scene actually played out. Trash mouth versus trash mouth, it would have been real interesting. Richie goes back to the city center, the place where he was nearly killed by the Paul Bunyan statue as a child. He remembered the incident that had happened back then. Then he sees a poster in a similar style to one of the posters for rock shows that his mother never would have let him go to. But the concert being advertised was something called Richie Tozier's All Dead Rock Show. I think when Richie discovers his own missing poster in the movie, this is what the director was trying to replicate. When he looked back to the Paul Bunyan statue, Paul was no longer there. In his place was a giant plastic version of Pennywise, the dancing clown, and the lips bleeding with red paint parted to reveal huge, razor-pointed teeth. This time, however, Richie ran for it. He could hear Pennywise's voice booming after him. He made it to the sidewalk to see that the statue had been replaced yet again, this time with one of his favorite rock idols, Buddy Holly. He feels an immense pain in one of his contacts and blinks it out of his eye. All returns to normal, but Richie can still hear the laughter of Pennywise echoing in his head. That night, they all reconvened at the library for drinks and reminiscence when Richie has an epiphany, and he remembers seeing the arrival of It in the smoke hole for the first time since he was a kid. When this happens, he reaches to push his glass up on his nose, temporarily forgetting that he'd been wearing contacts for the last 20 years, and once again he feels the smoke in his eyes. Before they leave, scars on their hands that were cut for the blood oath all of those years ago reopen, and everyone joins hands, causing the inside of the library to go into a whirlwind of power. Richie goes back to the hotel and starts to fall asleep when he receives a phone call from Beverly, asking him to come to Eddie's room. Without asking questions, he shows up to a room with a maimed Eddie Kasprak and a dead Henry Bowers. They find out that Mike was attacked before he left the library, so Richie calls the hospital using his news reporter voice to gather information that the police chief wouldn't give out to them. The group decides that enough was enough. It was responsible for the suicide of their friend Stan, and possibly the death of Mike. Eddie had also been injured. The only thing left for them to do was kill that f***ing clown. Richie took the wheel, and Beverly, Eddie, Bill, and Ben piled into the limousine that Eddie had driven to Derry. Their destination was the Barrens, the place where they had climbed down into the sewers to try to kill it 27 years ago. Pennywise he uses the car radio to taunt them and threaten them, first doing an ad read for the Richie Tozier All Dead Rock Show. That reminds me, it's time for me to play an ad as well, but don't go away because Richie Tozier plays a hand in the final showdown with it. Literally. Richie parks the limo next to the bridge, and they go to the pumping station where they had entered the sewers once before. The machinery had been turned off, and they were able to descend into the sewers, trudge and crawl their way through dirty water and sewage, eventually finding the inner layer of it. Again, their minds are unable to process the deadlights, but this time they're able to tell that there's some other shape behind the spider, which is described as being like someone moving behind a movie screen, which I find interesting because of the tendency of it to take the form of the monsters that Richie has seen in movies. The spider comes for Bill, and the ritual begins begins once again. Bill and It engage in an out-of-body showdown in the macroverse. This time, it doesn't go as well for Bill. The celestial being known as the turtle is no longer there to help him. Richie notices this back in the chamber because he sees Bill's face contort as if his spirit is in pain or struggling. All along, Richie has been the support for Bill. The photo album, 29 knee bolts, the stormy afternoon in the Barrens being a few examples. Richie runs up to the spider stinger and uses his Irish cop voice to distract it. He gets whacked into the darkness by it and joins Bill in the macroverse, where he does what Bill was unable to do this time around. He bites into its metaphysical tongue and hangs on tight. He flies past the shell of the turtle, possibly its corpse. He approaches another barrier, but he can't grasp the shape, but he thinks it could be a wall of stakes. No, no, not those stakes. These stakes. Maybe a reference to its appearing to Ben in the form of Dracula one time? Richie finds Bill and takes his hand, then turns the tables on its and threatens to kill it, right then and there, if it doesn't bring them back to the physical world. Richie uses his mind to hang on tight to it, nearly losing his grip before arriving back in the actual spider's chamber. When they come back, they find Eddie seriously injured, as he had tried to attack it with his aspirator, as he did to the crawling eye in 1958, but he got his arm dismembered and was bleeding out on the floor of the chamber. Eds, Eds, oh my god, Bill, Ben, someone, he's lost his arm, his- He's looked up at Beverly and saw she was crying, the tears coursing down her dirty cheeks. Richie, what? Richie was down on his hands and knees, staring at him desperately. Don't call me Eds, he said and smiled. Those would be Eddie's final words. Beverly took him in her arms and urged Richie, who wanted to stay and comfort Eddie in his final moments, to go on after the spider, so that it doesn't come back after another 27 years. If that thing comes back when I'm 70. Let's finish it once and for all. 
Bill and Richie chased it to the deepest part of the chamber, further than they'd ever been before. It begs them to let it go, offering them power, success, and long lives beyond their wildest dreams. They both simultaneously plunged into it. The monster lashed out at them, injuring Richie, who struggled not to drown in its guts. Bill ended it when he crushed the heart of it in his hands, where it exploded. Bill took Richie in his arms and tried to find Beverly and Ben in the dark, since the deadlights that had been illuminating the place died along with the spider. When they reconvene, Richie comes back too. The tunnel that they're in starts shaking, a side effect of the violent storm taking place above them. They have to leave Eddie behind in order to try to save Bill's wife, Audra, and Richie carries her for a bit as they make their way back to the surface, perhaps his final gesture of support towards his friend Bill. Richie flew back to California a few days later, and after the defeat of It's, each member of the Losers Club gradually started to lose their memories of everything that had happened in Derry. Later in the week, Mike Hanlon gave Richie a call in Beverly Hills. At first, it went to the answering machine, and when Richie picked it up, he said that he let Mike talk to the answering machine for as long as he did because for a slight moment, he had no idea who Mike was. Just like when Mike first reached out to him to tell his old friends that It had come back. Richie Tozier was a joker and a troublemaker, but he played an important part in the group, using his eyes and his creative voice impressions to help them stand a chance against it, and he was always there for his pals when they needed him. Kind of like how I'm gonna be here for you, the viewers, with more episodes of Horror History. Just click the playlist on the left to see me analyze more characters like Bill Denbro, Stan Uris, and others. And remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, so even if you do lose your memories, I'll still be able to see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.